One creature above all others has haunted our imagination. On land and in the air, the dragon has left its mark in the folklore of our ancestors. But what if these fantastic stories were more than myth? What if the legends were true? This is the story of a unique family that survived from the time of the dinosaur to make a final stand in the Middle Ages. A scientific exploration of a remarkable species. This is the natural history of the most extraordinary creature that never existed. The Cretaceous period, a time when the world was ruled by the most fearsome predator that ever walked the earth. Tyrannosaurus Rex. The T-Rex has been forced to this remote place from his usual hunting ground. Something has been raiding his territory and food has become scarce. He hasn't eaten for days. At last, a potential kill. But the T-Rex is cautious. He has never seen a creature like this before. Hunger drives him on. The T-Rex has a clear weight advantage, so his prey bluffs, extends its wings to give the illusion that it is much larger than it really is. But the T-Rex isn't buying it, so the creature tries a different tack. Cry carries for miles. To this predator's sensitive ears, the sound is incredibly painful. But the T-Rex is still not deterred. And up here, there's nowhere to hide. But it is the T-Rex, not his prey, that is fatally exposed. They are not alone. This is an adult female, a fully grown prehistoric dragon. This is her territory and she's protecting her son. Tyrannosaurus will not last the night. But the mother is also seriously injured. With a broken wing, she can no longer hunt to feed herself or her offspring.
But 65 million years from now, the T-Rex's skull will inspire a theory in the mind of a brilliant young paleontologist. This is one of only three intact T-Rex skulls that have ever been found. It all started five years ago when I discovered this complete T-Rex in Montana. It was big news. Dr. Jack Tanner, paleontologist, an overnight celebrity. But then I blew it. I proposed the existence of an impossible creature. You see, my T-Rex skull was damaged in a very specific way. To me, the injuries were evidence of an attack by a predator unlike anything known to science. The evidence was undeniable. So I tried to get others to see things my way. The nature of these marks suggests that this skull was punctured by three sharp objects in an arc. It's a talon formation. But I don't believe that these puncture wounds actually killed the Rex. The real death blow is here. See? Symmetrical deposits of carbon down both sides of the skull. These are scorch marks. Precise. Aim. Perhaps my childhood obsession had clouded my thinking. You see, as a kid, I was mad about dragons. Dragons from the high seas, flying dragons from Greenland, fire-breathing dragons from Europe. And here's the thing that got me. These myths came from all over the world, right? From cultures that could never have met. And yet from the Andes to the Himalayas, you could hear stories of dragons. How? Here's a kid's best guess because the stories were real. Last week, guess what? Out of nowhere, the Dragon Man is thrown a lifeline, another find. Not Montana this time, but on a Romanian mountain. Extreme skiers had fallen into a network of ice caves. They found something horrific. A body, and he wasn't wearing the latest lightweight thermals, it was ancient. There's nothing the police could do with a 15th century corpse. This was a case for historians, not detectives. But police being police, they couldn't resist a nose around. They uncovered a medieval crime scene, a massacre. They moved deeper into the cave and soon wished they hadn't. Now, I don't know the Romanian word for dragon, but someone said it. So the Romanians contact the museum in London. Is this thing a hoax or what? Now, the museum, they're ready to pass. They have an international reputation to maintain. I get to hear about it and figure I'm the perfect solution. The man with no reputation to lose. Mm. 
Have you seen the pictures? Every head of department has seen the pictures. And? Well, the museum's been formally asked by the Romanian authorities in the strictest confidence to help with this find. It's got them in quite a state. They don't know what they've got and neither do we. Can I go? On the museum's behalf? I can call a meeting. So here I am with two of the museum's rising stars who see me as a bad career move. We've got strict orders. If this thing's of any interest, get it shipped back to London. If it's a hoax, make our excuses and leave. If news gets out, I'm the fall guy. Either way, I lose. Unless, by one chance in a million, it's not a hoax. Maybe then I get my reputation back. It starts badly. They've moved everything off of the mountain. Who knows what evidence might have been disturbed. So we're in the backwoods, at a makeshift mortuary in an overgrown shed. The official word is the bodies have been blackened by ice, but I wonder. Ask me, I'd say they have a different story to tell. But I mind my own business. My assignment is through here. Nobody said anything about a whole carcass. It's massive. I can see why the Romanians were cagey. I should be too, if I had any sense. This has got to be a hoax. Hasn't it? Okay, so let's get this over with. 12.05 p.m., June 25th. Dr. Tanner and team have forced to begin an immediate examination of an unidentified animal. The skin looks real enough. Too well preserved. If this is a hoax, it's the best I've ever seen. Okay, sweetheart. What are you? The hide is scaly. It has a tail. Now both suggest that this is some sort of reptile, and yet there are two limbs visible ending with what appear to be talons. Now, these are general characteristics. Characteristics of powered flight. Could this thing really fly? too heavy for these small wings. 
They couldn't create nearly enough lift to get its carcass off the ground. You see, to fly, you have to obey the laws of physics. There is a relationship between weight, power, and wingspan. Wing measurements give us a wingspan under 20 feet. It's not enough. This creature looks built to fly. It's got all the parts, but at the moment they just don't add up. Estimated weight? I'm guessing 900 pounds. Maybe 950. He's looking like this. Don't tell me. The wing to weight ratio is way out. Couldn't fly, right? It's too heavy. A creature with wings that can't fly. That spells trouble. Two weeks have passed since his mother saved him from the T-Rex, and the young dragon is in trouble. His mother is dead. The injury to her wing proved fatal. He cannot fly, and with no one to hunt for him, he too will die. The smell from his mother's carcass is attracting scavengers. For the moment, they're just pterosaurs. But who knows what other creatures may pick up the scent. This dragon lost his mother at a critical moment. Somehow, he has to teach himself to fly before it's too late. And if he does get airborne, it will be thanks to one of nature's most astonishing feats of engineering. This just gets stranger by the minute. Internal scans show a massive heart. That's typical of flying creatures. Those chest muscles would need large quantities of oxygen-rich blood. Your bones are perfectly designed for flight, too. The internal structure is very specialized. It's honeycombed. You see this lightweight structure in bird skeletons. Their bones are strong, but still light enough for flight. But you're still too heavy for those wings. Come on, what's your secret? Any good news? There's something unusual inside the chest cavity. What are these? The image is too fuzzy. We don't have time to speculate. I'm going inside. plot thickens. The second pair of lungs? But there's no internal structure. Bladders, maybe? They must have held something. You pass me a syringe, please? Analysis, please. Unable to hunt, the young dragon exploits the only food available to him. His mother's meat will keep him alive for a few days. But if he can't fly, he can't hunt. His future looks bleak. Yet, even in death, his mother may still help him. In their gut, all creatures contain bacteria that help them to break down food. And as they do this, they release gas. But the bacteria inside dragons are unique and the gas they produce is special. It is channeled into two storage chambers, the dragon's flight bladders. Alongside the super light skeleton, these bladders provide the key to flight, provided you know how to use them.
this young dragon will have to learn fast. The scent of his decomposing mother has attracted the most dangerous creature imaginable. An aging male dragon. Its broken horns and dull markings betray a dragon at the end of his days. And this is bad news for our juvenile. Continuous battles over territory mean that most males never reach old age. But this dragon is still around. He's a survivor, and he's hungry. The youngster senses that given the choice, he'd prefer fresh meat. And this time, his mother isn't there to save him. His only hope is to take to the air. Predominantly hydrogen. Hydrogen. It's 14 times less dense than air. It's odorless, colorless. You put hydrogen in a balloon, what happens? It floats away, right? The juvenile heads for the trees. The old male cannot fly here. Inside, the young dragon's body is working overtime. Heart beating, muscles pumping, and hydrogen is collecting at a phenomenal rate. Fully expanded, what would you say is a cubic capacity of one of these things? 15 cubic feet. There are two. That's 30. 30 cubic feet, a pump full of hydrogen. What kind of lift does that give us? Not quite there, but maybe. The youngster's flight bladders are now full, but crucially, so is his stomach. The undigested meat is weighing him down. Just in time, instinct takes over. He empties his stomach spreads his wings. <laughs> Exhausted, the old male abandons the chase. Our young dragon has found his wings, just in time and for the very first time in his life. Analysis suggests it's to be confirmed that maybe, just maybe, this creature could fly. This is no hoax. This thing is for real. A gigantic flying lizard. Too much to expect that you could breathe fire, too. If it's interesting, bring it back to the museum. That was the plan. Well, it's interesting, all right. But let's see what else we can find out before we have to leave. OK. Time to put our heads into the lion's mouth. was clearly a carnivore, a formidable predator. What's going on here? You've got incisors for ripping meat and molars, grinding seat? teeth. Stingrays have the same kind of teeth for crunching rock-hard shells. But what would a meat-eating predator want with teeth like these? Several years have passed, 
and how juvenile is now a young adult. But he is homeless. Without territory, he will never have a regular supply of food, and he will never mate. But his time has come. In the past, he has strayed accidentally inside the territory of dominant males. Today, there is no mistake. It is a daring act. Half of all young males are killed in territorial battles. The dull coat of adolescence has transformed into a vibrant display designed to intimidate rival males. But before he makes himself known, he takes on stores of a rare and valuable mineral found at the heart of every dragon territory. He is preparing for the fight of his life. And these rocks will hold the key. The inner surface of the mouth is incredible. It's almost armor plated. Ah, now this is something I've definitely seen before. A fleshy valve at the back of the throat. This flap is very similar to the false palates found in crocodile throats. Crocs use it to stop their lungs from flooding while holding prey underwater. It's a very distinctive shape and come to think of it, I think I've seen fossils of this somewhere. This is a highly specialized structure. Can you scout the excavations in uh, Dick Sides Museum, see if anything like this bone has popped up anywhere else? Or maybe it's an adaptation. Maybe it wasn't used to prevent water flooding the lungs. Maybe it's to prevent a backdraft of fire from burning the throat. Boy, when you say it out loud, does it sound lame. It doesn't look like fire ever came out of this creature's mouth. No carbonized food residue, no signs of charring whatsoever. It's as if all the tools are here, they just haven't been used. Perhaps it didn't breathe fire at all. Well, maybe you're right. Let's take a step back. Nature isn't constrained by our lack of imagination. Think about it. The natural world is full of bizarre creatures that have the most extraordinary weapons, tongues like spears, colors that change, and shapes. Lassoes even, but a creature that breathes fire? Bear with me. Meet the bombardier beetle. Now when this guy gets angry, he fires out liquid at a temperature of over 200 degrees Fahrenheit. How does he do it? By pumping a liquid fuel into a reaction chamber where a catalyst ignites it. The exploding chemicals have nowhere to go but out. And with a bang! Now, is that how dragons did it? In the heart of his territory, the resident dragon, the alpha male, blasts a warning into the air. It signals that he is fit, healthy, and confident enough to waste precious fire on a display. The message is not lost on our young challenger. If he has any chance at all of winning this duel, he must be at his very best, because the stakes are high. With territory comes not only a guaranteed supply of food, but the one thing every young male needs if he is to leave his mark on the next generation. Females. And this female is the reason he is here. She's in season and for just one month will breed with the alpha male. He's killed for her before, and he'll do it again. OK, 
Okay. Back to basics. What do we need to produce fire? We need fuel, and we need something to light it with, an ignition system. We need a light, combustible material. Like gas? Now, what did you say was in these things? A hydrogen and methane? How could I have been so stupid? I need a light. Hydrogen and methane, both combustible gases, both lighter than air. These sacks double up as buoyancy aids and fuel stores. Evolution at its most economical. So far, so good. But how did you ignite it? Can I take a sample, please? The Alpha Male is an experienced warhorse. With nothing to prove, he's lost the bright colors that mark out the young challenger. Experience tells immediately. The alpha male catches our youngster with his first strike. Instinctively, the young dragon heads for cover. The cold, damp clouds will also dull the pain. But the alpha male is not without his problems. These dogfights are calculated affairs. The hydrogen in his fuel tanks also has to keep him airborne. Every blast of flame reduces his mobility. The challenger appears to accept defeat. He heads for the territorial boundary. It seems that now his best hope is to escape with his life. The alpha male drives on. He would rather finish him now. But he has misjudged his young opponent. The youngster is faster, more agile and, crucially, he has a full payload to burn. Wouldn't you know it? That sediment on the creature's molars? It's rock, with particularly large traces of platinum. Platinum is not just a precious metal, it's also a catalyst. Like our old friend the bombardier beetle, fuel needs an ignition system. And when platinum combines with oxygen and hydrogen, it combusts. Oh! <laughs> it produces fire. Our young pretender has triumphed. The female prepares to accept her new dragon overlord. All his life he's fought the odds and at last he's made it. My theory was right after all. Enjoy the proof. You could fly, you could breathe fire. 65 million years ago, one of your ancestors killed my T-Rex. So how did your ancestors survive when the dinosaurs didn't? The natural history of our planet tells me that it simply couldn't have happened. 65 million years ago, at the peak of our dragon's success, a curtain comes crashing down on the Cretaceous period. A meteorite the size of Mount Everest 
smashes into the planet. Known as the KT event, it wipes out nearly all life on Earth. But somehow your species did survive. How? If the KT meteorite finished off the dinosaurs, how did a giant species like yours survive? Let's think straight. What are the large creatures survived, KT? Sharks, skates, rays, turtles, coelacanths, among others. And all have in common? Their marine life. On crocodiles, too. Crocodiles? The false palate is found in crocodiles. Raised nostrils, suggesting a creature that could hold its prey in its jaws and breathe while completely submerged in water. But this creature didn't swim, it flew. It has wings and talons, not webbed feet. Suggesting the palate must be an evolutionary relic. Somewhere in the dim and distant past, this creature's ancestors lived in water. You swam from extinction. Water did indeed provide dragons with the escape route from one of the deadliest events in the Earth's history. But not the prehistoric dragon. The land-living dragon was indeed wiped out. But it was not alone. The dragon family had another branch. At the time of the KT catastrophe, the prehistoric dragon had a cousin, the marine dragon. Both species were descended from a common ancestor, but they followed very different evolutionary paths. The marine dragon lived in the sea, and life in the sea was less affected by the KT event. As they evolved, their flight bladders became swim bladders. Their large wings reduced to become fins, and their powerful tails became rudders. Marine dragons thrived. Then, as global temperatures rose and the land recovered, some marine dragons returned to shallow waters. Through estuaries and rivers, they eventually made their first tentative steps back onto land. sea serpent. Are the legends actually about marine dragons? That false pallet, guess what? Looks like it's turned up at a dig site. This could be our missing link. Well, what kind of environment are we talking about? Forest. What kind of forest? Bamboo. I knew I'd seen the pallet before. It was in that excavation in China. I thought it had been from an extinct branch of crocodilian. Turns out to be much more exciting. So the water dragon came back on land and evolved into new species, at least one of them in Asia. Forest dwellings. What would you be like? Well, in Chinese mythology, dragons are low-slung, elongated, slender. The kind of body one would expect from an animal that's recently adapted from water. Was it really suited for life in a forest?
The dragons that return to land discover that the prehistoric world has changed. The era of the dinosaur is over and a new order of animals has risen up to fill the void. Mammals. And mammals provide plentiful food for dragons. The trick is to catch them. The superb camouflage and silent movement has made this dragon all but invisible in the bamboo forest. The wings on this dragon are too small for flight, but the flight bladders provide gentle lift and allow her to glide silently across the forest floor. The markings on her skin break up her outline in the dappled forest light. And to be sure, this massive relic from the age of the dinosaur has had to develop new tricks. Hunting mammals in this compact environment requires tremendous guile. Small, fast and agile, mammals have incredibly acute hearing and smell. Alerted, they can disappear in an instant. Positioning herself downwind from her prey, she lies in wait and listens intently. But she's not ready to strike just yet. Not before unveiling a highly specialized weapon that gives her an edge against this wary prey. <laughs> The forest dragon has developed a remarkable behavioral strategy. Mimicry. By carefully controlling the flow of gases from her flight bladder, she manipulates her voice and entices her prey. But her hunt is disturbed. There's an intruder in her territory, a creature that will come between this dragon and her prey for the last time. It's not just the invasion of her territory that riles her or the loss of the odd meal. This animal is a real and emerging threat to her very survival. A glide is the best her stunted wings allow. But she has the scent now and is determined to finish things. Smaller and more mobile in the forest undergrowth, the new mammalian predators are proving to be accomplished hunters. Left alone, these predators will outcompete her for food, and she would starve. She isn't going to let it happen. The dragon closes to striking range. She blends into her surroundings, unseen, but not unheard. The sound is not a warning to go away, but an invitation to come closer. Tiger senses a meal. But he is a cautious hunter. The dragon tries a subtle change of pitch. The prey sounds distressed. An injury, perhaps? The 
tiger falls for it hook, line and sinker. One less rival, one more meal. The kill is taken to a clearing. The forest dragon has adapted its ancient weapon into a culinary tool. Cooked meat is far more easily digested. But the flames draw another mammal near. A species that will prove a far greater threat to her survival. I came here to expose a hoax and suddenly a whole reptile family is coming to life. What a family. Of all the prehistoric giants, only yours survived the KT catastrophe. And you weren't the only dragon. Seems there was a forest-dwelling Asian dragon, a sea dragon too, just like the myths. Could there have been others? I need more time. The helicopter will be with us any minute and soon we'll be heading back to England. And once this thing's back in the museum, I won't get a look in. Until then, we'll keep scanning. You need to look at this. I've just noticed these fragments here. Well, what are they? The crushed rib? No, the rib cage is totally intact. But they're bone fragments, right? What are they? Well, that explains the weird proportions. Of course. It's got four legs. And two wings. Six limbs. <laughs> no vertebrate that ever lived has six limbs. It's true, every land-based vertebrate on the planet has four limbs, front feet, back feet, arms and legs. And airborne creatures too, feet and wings, they all have four limbs. But not this dragon. It's got six, it can't be a fake, not now. Well, if those legs are for real, then they'll show up in its DNA. Oh my. Now that's some freaky mutation. This creature has a genetic adaptation unlike anything in the animal kingdom, and wouldn't you know it? In the gene responsible for generating limbs. And it's here in mythology, too. The Chinese, the Aztecs, Polynesians, they all drew images of creatures with the same adaptation. Giant, six-limbed reptiles. The clue was there all along. How could I have missed it? These drawings aren't wild imagination. They're records. These primitive people were telling us something. We weren't listening. And if the images are accurate, then there are even more evidence that there were many types of dragon and they lived everywhere on the planet. Okay, we've got evidence for a marine dragon, the sea serpent of legend. A forest dragon that lived in Asia. The Chinese dragon that adorns a thousand pots. And you, well let's call you the mountain dragon. Have you left your mark on European folk history? Romania? 
Dragon iconography. Here you are. Recorded in stained glass. The locals called you the devil from the mountains. And the legend conforms pretty much to type. Terrorizing local folk, raiding livestock, breathing fire. A monumental battle to the death. Is this a 15th century photograph of you? So the local farmers gave you a name, the Mountain Devil. And what kind of devil were you? We're down to the wire. They'll be moving the body out any minute, and I'll have to leave with it. One last check. Could we have missed something? What's that in the heart? It's something embedded in the right atrium. That's not organic matter. This could be really important. Unequivocal evidence that dragons and humans were at war. Throughout the age of mammals, dragons survived. But their survival was precarious. Fire was the ace that kept them one step ahead of the competition. But in time, a new mammal emerged, small, vulnerable, but supremely intelligent. Physically, man was no match for a dragon but he recognized the possibilities of fire. With fire, mankind could clear forests for farmland, mold metal into savage weapons. In the evolutionary blink of an eye, mankind was pushing the most deadly predator in the natural history of our planet to the verge of extinction. They had turned the dragon's most potent weapon against them. The stories of these epic battles were recorded in folklore around the world, culminating here in Romania. A dark story passed down through generations the story of a demon on a mountain top and of knights drawn into the mist never to be seen again until now humans and dragons mortal enemies if these knights went looking for a dragon it looks like they found one This isn't ice damage, this is carbonization. These men were burned alive by a dragon for sure, but not ours. Our dragon never breathed fire. We haven't finished yet. Yes, we have. Look. 
Look. Carbon. I found it on one of those bodies out there. Those bodies have been scorched. They're right, of course. It's the find of the century, and we can't risk it turning to mush. But the mountains are calling me. What did those men find up there? They're ready for it! This section here. Am I just reading this? Is this a reproductive system? These are oviducts, right? Small ovaries. The female. Yet there's no evidence of follicular activity. The reproductive tract is immature. It's a juvenile. It's a baby. That clinched it. The creature in the autopsy room was a baby. The cave wasn't just the scene of a random crime. It was a nest. The local myth is starting to sound remarkably like an accurate verbal account of a real event. The knights weren't killed by our dragon. They were killed by an adult, perhaps defending its young. And a dragon corpse can tell us how their bodies worked, but a nest it can tell us so much more, how they lived. My guess, up in those mountains, we'll find evidence for a dragon family. Tanner is about to unravel a medieval tragedy. It is the 15th century, and a mountain dragon is under threat. The distant ancestors of this female mountain dragon fed on the wild herds that roamed the vast Asian grasslands. But the herds were tamed by man. For dragons, they were no longer fair game. They were livestock. And so the dragons that gorged themselves on the plains have been driven to the remote regions of Europe. And in this remote place, wild game is scarce. Today, she is hunting the rarest creature on Earth but not to eat. Today, she's looking for a mate. She spreads her scent throughout her territory. Strong winds carry the pheromones south. Female dragons mate once every seven years, yet this mature female has never seen a male dragon. Nevertheless, every year when she comes into season, instinct commands her to play out the rituals of attraction. Her season is almost finished, and the window will close for another year. Another change of plan, something interesting about a half mile below the cave. melting snow has revealed unusual features on the rock. A 
to the casual observer, they could be anything. Perhaps the result of some odd geological process. But me, I've got fire on my mind. And these rocks look like they've been scorched. No, no, don't worry about samples. I need you to follow this line. And look for more burn marks. And tread carefully, watch for hidden crevasses. Okay, approximately two hours due south. We we'll drop off point, heading towards the scene of death. Can you take a GPS reference? Okay. Evidence of discoloration of the rock. Seems to have been subjected to a blast of intense heat. It's literally scarred the rock. These rocks have been burned to melting point in symmetrical lines. The dimensions are frightening. Lightning couldn't do this. Forest fire? It's not likely. We're halfway up a mountain at the edge of a glacier. The lair is nearby. Was there some kind of fight? female returns to her den, a network of caves melted into dense glacial ice. Despite the cold temperatures outside, in here the temperature is relatively warm. Like an igloo, the thick walls retain heat. But the mountain dragon has another line of defense against the cold. From her marine ancestor, She's inherited a blood protein that prevents her tissues from freezing. It has proved vital to her species as they are forced into increasingly inhospitable habitats. Soon it will be autumn and her metabolism will slow as she prepares to hibernate through the bitter winter. have done their job, now it's our turn. Uh, set up ultrasonic mapping and grid digital tiles of all the surfaces. We need to get a clear picture of what this place looked like 600 years ago. Okay. Uh, can you begin excavation of the floor and the wall? Any extra forensics that we may have missed that may give us some clues as to the nature of the creature? I Reading to our one, set. The laser scanner will help us build a map of this place and then we can accurately record the position of everything that we find. The mapping results yet? I've gridded most of the cave, but it's a labyrinth in here. Does anyone's guess what's behind these walls? Glacial movement. Set those echo scan charges at minimum. We don't know how unstable this place is. Echo scanning. Small explosive charges send shock waves into the ice. The echoes will tell us what's behind them. What is it? I'm not sure. I know what this is. Dragon poop. Looks like organic matter. It's 
Beautifully preserved. Good work. Okay, bag it. Sorry. Evidence of bone shards. Look, these look like like fruit stones. Date stone? Not many date palm trees in the Carpathians 600 years ago. It's possible that she strayed, but it's more likely that this is the feces of another. And so the next question. Why would you travel such an immense distance across the continents and the climates? You know, what could possibly attract you to this place? Whatever dumped this had its last meal in a much warmer place. Somewhere a long way from here. The female's curiosity is aroused. It is a sound she has never heard before. Yet somehow it seems eerily familiar. She is compelled to investigate. Against all odds, a male mountain dragon has picked up our female scent. He's a nomadic dragon from the Atlas Mountains of North Africa. His search for a mate has brought him across southern Europe to the Carpathian Mountains. Now he has found her. Instinct takes over. And they do what their kind has done for thousands of years. It is a courtship ritual that is as perilous as it is spectacular. At the height of her climb, they lock talons and drop in a dazzling free fall. It is the ultimate test of faith. Torches in the mountain rock serve as mute testimony to a spectacular and successful dragon mating and a species on the verge of extinction that finds hope in a new generation. What is that? The initial investigation team must have had a lot on their minds. They sure overlooked this. <laughs> it's a nest. Judging from the size and shape of the calcified fragments and the curvature, I think it's safe to say that this egg was of considerable size. And given the fairly limited number of fragments, I think it's safe to say that only one egg would have been incubated at any one. Oh my God. Two eggs in a clutch. 
But only one of them made it. Crocodiles bury their eggs in active compost to keep them warm. Dragons have a much more direct method. The eggshells have heat-resistant properties that can withstand intense temperatures. In fact, without this searing heat, the dragon chicks inside would die of cold. Rocks shield the eggs from the direct blast, but they also retain heat, releasing it over a long period and keeping the temperatures inside the nest stable. If she is to become a mother, careful and constant temperature control is essential over the long incubation period. Her mate returns from hunting. He has been unsuccessful again. After mating, female dragons become aggressive, deeply defensive when any creature approaches the nest, even a mate. In order to placate her for the lack of food, he brings a gift. Another rock for the nest. The male is now clear to enter the cave. The female will take her turn to hunt. Now the male has responsibility for the nest. Special sensors in his tongue allow him to check the temperature. If the eggs fall below 60 degrees, the chicks will die. Yet, quite deliberately, he lowers the temperature. There is method in this apparent madness. Just like crocodiles, the temperature in the nest will determine the sex of the offspring. Cooler temperatures encourage the development of females. Males, even sons, will compete for territory, food, and breeding females. Females suit him better. In normal times, this self-serving strategy is sound, but in a species on the verge of extinction, an imbalance in the sexes could prove fatal. Should anything happen to him, this tiny group is finished. The female returns empty-handed from another hunt. The male is not at his post. Something is very wrong. The male has let the incubation temperature drop dangerously low. It is already too late for one of her chicks, but one might survive. The male senses trouble and makes his escape.
The cave continues to yield up its secrets at a fantastic rate. Bones from a domesticated sheep. You are preying on local livestock. Silly girl, you are playing a very dangerous game. The female has taken to raiding livestock for food. She has good reason. This is her daughter. And her survival is the most important thing now. But by stealing from farms, she risks provoking the locals and placing her daughter in danger. Unaware of the price on her head, the female dragon continues to equip her daughter for the future. She is passing on the secret of fire. These marks could have been made yesterday. They were after something in the rock. We'll need tests, but my guess is that we'll find platinum. This nest wasn't built here for the view. I've got the results through. Yes, look, one chamber through here. There's a second chamber behind us here. And there's a third chamber right over there. Three chambers. We've only got time to go to one, so what do you want to do? I have no idea. Wait a minute. What's that? There's something on the rock. Stand here. Stand here. Put your arm. This arm. Stay there. Don't move. No. Get on Whatever created that blast mark came from behind this wall. Set up the rover. We're going in here. The ROV, Remote Operated Vehicle. One of the latest additions to the paleontologist arsenal. The small camera can scoot through the tightest holes to send back pictures. Padre, 
venga il tuo regno, sia fatta la tua volontà, come in cielo e così in terra. Dacci oggi il nostro pane quotidiano. E rimetti a noi le nostre vite, le nostre colpe, come noi le rimettiamo ai nostri debitori. E non ci indurre in tentazione, ma liberaci dal male. Amen. After feeding, mother and daughter bask in the sun's warmth. Their wings soak up heat like solar panels. In a rare moment of intimacy, they lie together and share body warmth. Soon the mother will have to hunt, and her daughter will be left unguarded. The nights in the mortuary weren't alone. This place is looking more like a war zone. The question is, whatever killed them, is it still in there? With summer drawing to a close, the dragon is desperate to fatten herself and her baby before they hibernate. And in her desperation, she has all but cleared the local farms of livestock. Closer. I know it. Where are you? Wait, there's another passage. I'm going through here. <laughs> Once man and dragon lived side by side. Dragons were respected, even worshipped. Now they are hunted like vermin. Man has driven dragons to these remote habitats. Now even here, they are not safe. Without the ability to breathe fire, this immature youngster is vulnerable. But her assassins were reared on stories about their terrifying weaponry. Wary of the fire-breathing devil, they are cautious. Eventually they sense that this dragon carries no threat. Mother returns. Too late.
but her grieving will have to wait. She catches a scent, chilling yet familiar. In a final insult, the assassin wears the blood of her daughter as a trophy. These warriors may have survived many battles, but nothing can prepare them for the fury. They are about to reap the whirlwind. Like higher mammals, dragons invest many years in rearing their young, and like those mammals, they feel loss. But the trauma of her daughter's death has brought the female dragon into season. She may still be mourning, but her body knows that to survive, she must mate again. She starts again the process of attracting a mate back into her territory. She displays the armor from her daughter's assassins. Dragons are naturally attracted to reflective objects. It is a long shot but perhaps a glint might catch his eye. The chances are that he's no longer alive. There's nowhere left to hide. As winter draws in, Hibernation beckons. She'll have to survive the winter on her meager reserves of fat. Her body temperature drops dramatically and she goes into suspended animation. All her usual functions are placed on emergency status and her hydrogen reserves fall to almost zero. And in this state, She's as vulnerable as her daughter. Where are you? Female is woken from her torpor. More men have made the climb to her lair. This time they are better prepared. Mercenaries paid by the local farmers to settle a score.
Without food, she cannot make hydrogen. And without her precious gas, she cannot fly or breathe fire. Over the years, the cave was sealed by snow and ice, and the bloody battle frozen from time. The dragon faded from reality to mythology, and would have stayed that way had these two dragons not revealed their secrets to us. I left the museum with my reputation in pieces. I return with the story to end all stories and evidence that will rewrite natural history. The creatures of legend were real, but the legends gave a twisted view of reality. I fill my colleagues in about the fantastic family that we have unearthed. A group of animals that lived alongside the dinosaurs that escaped annihilation by going underwater, that re-emerged all over the globe, claiming forests and conquering mountains. But I can tell that they're not listening. They want to see the evidence firsthand. And who can blame them? This way, and goggles on, please. The story of life on our planet has been rewritten by a mother and her child reunited. <laughs> and that's what we have here the last of a legendary line. Myth made real. The myth of a sheep stealer. The reality of a mother struggling to feed her young. The myth of a vicious beast. The reality of survival at any cost. The myth of knights that climbed a mountain to slay a dragon. The reality, persecution and extinction. Now every dragon myth from around the world begs the same question. Were 
they real too? And the most important question of them all, were these really the last dragons? These were taken two months ago. 